Hello guys, welcome back to Unique Arts. I'm Costco Picasso. Today I got another lecture for you. This is on Romanticism in England. So we're continuing with Romanticism. Uh, last week we started with Romanticism of Spain. If you haven't watched that lecture, please feel free to go back and watch it. You don't necessarily need to though if you don't feel like it. And uh, we also did Neoclassicism before that, which of course I, I also recommend, but again, you don't need to. Uh, but we will be continuing with Romanticism in England. Hopefully this doesn't take too long. I do have a bit more to look at than we did in Spain. There are a few more bigger names. The only really big name in Spain during the Romantic era is Goya for painting. There are a couple other guys we looked at, which of course I think are it's good to look at a few. And the thing is to keep in mind that there are a lot more than what we do look at. There are always a lot more artists that are producing that are, sometimes are, in many regards are even more that are pretty famous during their own time. It's just that they aren't as famous per the art establishment in per art history textbooks or whatever so we just don't talk about them as much really today that is but today we're gonna dive right into england which i've never been to england <laughs> but i am an american in fact my surname is english so i do feel some sort of affinity to england although if i'm being honest in many regards i don't even i don't feel an affinity towards england as a whole it's mostly towards like somerset and then also just other counties in southwest England because that's where vast majority of my English heritage comes from. But regardless, uh, that's besides the point. <laughs> All right, so Romanticism in England. This is a quote from one of the painters we will be looking at. That is, painting is but another word for feeling, which is perhaps a bit of a romantic quote in its own regard, but regardless. And then just to give you a rehash of some of the stuff that we will be seeing with romanticism and sorry if i sound a little odd i've been a little bit under the weather but regardless we get the fascination with power of nature and sublime we are definitely going to see that in england uh perhaps we're going to see it here more than we did in spain uh, but regardless and then some exoticism yeah uh we saw that a good amount in spain too but we're going to see some exoticism we're going to look at the supernatural a bit uh we do get violent and horrific themes again uh, nationalism is a big one. Uh, we like our country. We love our country. I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. Love your country, hate your government. That's generally my motto. And then uh, longing for the past, as well as intense emotion and passion and imagination. It's always a good one, right? So uh, those are things that are just general throughout romanticism because you will find that the subject matter still varies pretty heavily. The style varies pretty heavily. But lots of this stuff will be there, even if it's kind of like an undertone to the work itself. So look kind of briefly, and this is pretty early romantic art. This is Thomas Gainsborough. Uh, this is Blue Boy. These, This is what you would call romantic portraiture. We're not really going to look at this, uh, but for just a few seconds here at the beginning. This one, and just to give you an idea, some of this stuff is still in pop culture. Here's Kermit. <laughs> I think... Uh, you guys know this one. This is his green boy because, you know, he's green. He's still wearing blue. But this one as well. This is the portrait of Mrs. Richard Brinsley Sheridan. If you aren't acquainted with the other liberal arts, I highly recommend doing that. She is the wife to a renowned playwright, Richard Brinsley Sheridan, an Irishman, actually. Although I think he probably lived and worked most of his life in England, as was common for the successful Irishman in that time. But he wrote several plays the most famous easily being the school for scandal which is a great play I highly recommend you wa uh, watch a rendition or read it if you haven't but this is his wife and this is what we would call romantic portraiture it is actually quite similar to baroque portraiture not nearly as austere as neoclassical portraiture but in although it's kind of flowery and fluffy uh, and romanticized, kind of like Baroque portraiture is before neoclassical, it's a bit, and Rococo uh, portraiture in many regards, I suppose, as well, It's even it feels even more airy. Like, the brushwork is feel, feels very loose. You can still get the detail, and she herself looks very nice. It's a bit more fluffy beyond that, though, and even she herself is relatively fluffy. Her face is in the most focus. But it's also kind of a landscape painting. Gainsborough actually was a big landscape lover. He loved to paint landscapes. And like Sir Joshua Reynolds, and you'll see this actually is not uncommon, they really like to paint landscapes. 
but they have to paint portraits because that's what brings in the money. So as far as making a living, we're going to do portraiture. But this is actually life size. It's a full, you get full length uh, portraits. These are pretty big, pretty expensive. We get a, the very feathery, fluffy brush stroke. Uh, her hair is kind of like mimicked in the leaves of the trees. Her scarf is like the kind of even like the gla the grass and the clouds, but it's full of motion. She's a sitting patron, but you get this full sense of motion from it. And uh, she's kind of one with nature. She was a renowned uh, soprano singer, and of course she was married to Mr. Richard Brindley Sheridan. We are going to be looking at this guy as well. And lots of you might know the name of this artist, but probably won't associate his name with visual art. And that is William Blake. So William Blake is a pretty famous Romantic era guy from England. He is a famous poet, and his poetry is a lot more famous these days, but he also did paint. They feel a bit more like illustrations, like this is stuff that I feel like I would have seen published in a book in 1980 or something like that. You know, just that, that feel for it. It's very stylized, very interesting. Uh, this is when I feel like you start to really get these more unique styles in romanticism, when we think about romantic art and just like art back in the early 19th century, it's we think of classical art in many regards. We think it's all strict, uh, natural, naturalistic, representational art, and that's not entirely the case. Of course, this is still representational, and we are still looking at pretty accurate physiques here, but it feels pretty fantastic, too. So this is just Satan smiting Job with sore boils. We're not really looking at this one. This one is a bit more interesting. And take just half a second before I show you the title, and guess what you think this is, what the subject is here. Okay, now if you guess that it's Elohim creating Adam, you would have been correct. So Elohim would just be God in this sense. Uh, there's a much more famous painting, The Creation of Adam, with God touching his finger to Adam by Michelangelo on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. But this was done in 1795 by William Blake. It's quite a bit different, right? That's a Renaissance painting. This is a bit later, but he is very much interested in spirituality. And if you, if obviously, if we're painting religious subjects, in our, where you could probably get the idea that we like religious subject matter or just spirituality, he felt divinely inspired himself. We're kind of the goal here is kind of explain reason for existence, like who we are, why are we here. Uh, he was a very heavy critic of European materialism and just the lack of spirituality uh, that was very common in Europe and even more common today. Uh, also, was a critic of the inequality of women. And he also felt the Enlightenment had failed, largely because of, like, the French Revolution and then, like, Robespierre with the Reign of Terror. Uh, obviously not a whole lot of good stuff in that in those instances, but... Regardless, he joined the Royal Academy in 1779, uh, but he also thought that once he, after he joined, it, f it repressed imagination. And I honestly, I think about the like the art establishment today. I think it very much represses imagination. They don't promote good art; they promote art based off identity politics. I've made videos on that before. It's really annoying. <laughs> but regardless, so uh, but they repress imagination. But not only that, creativity and. Perhaps because of that, he wanted to be so starkly different from what the Academy was trying to pump out. And he's very much not acclaimed during his time as an artist. But he, again, is well known for his poetry in his own lifetime. He did shun oil painting, which is the most common medium. Like, since the Renaissance, more so the late Renaissance, because oil painting is not an Italian thing. It's made in the North, and uh, the Italians will adopt it by the time, by time you get to the late Renaissance. Uh, he should... It's, it's the dominant thing to do. If you're doing painting, you are painting in oil for the most part. And uh, he shuns that because he thinks it's too much associated with the Academy. And so this is a uh, monotype. It's actually printed in a book. And hence perhaps why I was saying it. It makes me think of you know something I'd find in a book in the 1980s or whatever. But regardless. So he did look to medieval manuscripts for his inspiration, which I think you can see that, right? If it's more reminiscent of that than perhaps the Italian tradition, that Renaissance tradition. And uh, again, this is similar, same subject matter essentially as the creation of Adam by Michelangelo. This is much more painful. I mean, look at Adam. And then his pose himself is kind of like Christ on the cross. 
but it's just over art overall the it's so much different and he's and god has wings which i feel like you hardly ever see god with wings and stuff too but he's still illustrating the book of genesis this is of course the lord god formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul so i mean there's adam on the ground there and uh looks like a painful creation process but there's uh, michelangelo's for reference uh this one is obviously a classic great painting regardless if you have uh, stylistic preferences but this there they are side by side very very different give you a very different feel i think painful is again the word that comes to mind for me for blake's on the left more serene for michelangelo but i think they both still get the point across if anything i feel like the one on the left makes me think more of the physical the creation of adam's physical body and the one on the right makes me think more of the spirit put into adam's body if that makes sense. Let me know if you agree with me on that. But here's some more. This is the Ancient of Days. This is for a frontispiece of Europe of Prophecy. So again, a book. Very interesting. Very, like, fantasy-esque. This is a metal etching, actually. It was hand-colored. And this is actually what... Uh, give you an idea of Blake's mindset on the art he was creating. Blake wrote in a letter to artist John Flaxman, who we actually looked at a little bit in neoclassical stuff, that his mind was filled with books and pictures of old, which I wrote and painted in ages of eternity before my mortal life. So he's definitely a proponent to the immortality of the soul, much like Plato was. And here's just that same idea, essentially, from William Wordsworth, a romantic poet. We still are, we're still thinking about God in the eternities in romanticism. We're not wholeheartedly ex just expressly doing religious paintings like you get a lot during the renaissance but we still have that idea and perhaps we're romanticizing it a bit like obviously this is pretty romantic and pretty nice we're putting it to romantic poetry in my opinion is the best so i mean here you go our birth is but a sleep and a forgetting the soul that rises with us our life star hath had elsewhere its setting and cometh from afar not an entire forgetfulness and not an utter nakedness but trailing clouds of glory do we come from god who is our home heaven lies about us in our infancy okay we're gonna look at this artist he is perhaps the most famous because even lots of modernists today like him because he's pretty influential for a lot of early modernists and some postmodernists you could say uh, but this is joseph mallard william turner jmw turner he's got two full names joseph mallard and then also william turner but this is fisherman at sea from 1796 and this one is like it's got that su it's like such a stark green kind of gross color but it's got such a unique feel to it we're not really going to talk too in depth about this one but you get that that kind of haziness that he's going to go like pretty wholeheartedly into later in his career uh but very very skilled very loose hazy uh ideas that come with his paintings uh this one is also turner but this is in the style of a baroque artist uh called claude lorraine that we have not looked at in this course but that was his favorite old master painter. He, Claude Lorraine was a Baroque uh, French painter and uh, known for painting his uh, idyllic landscapes. This is actually one of a pair showing the rise and fall of an ancient empire. So you'll find during the Romantic era a series of paintings like, oh, one, two, three, and four for this whole rise of empire or fall of empire or youth or in childhood and adulthood and stuff like that is all, it's actually pretty common. Uh, we haven't really looked at it any yet, and but there's two in this, which is not very many, but more than one, I guess, about the same subject. But this one itself is supposed to be symbolizing Carthage. Carthage is the uh, empire that Hannibal, Hannibal, we all know Hannibal, right? Like um, he was their, he was the Carthaginian general that brought elephants across the Alps to try to conquer Rome. Uh, Rome ends up absolutely decimating um, Carthage, essentially. It was just across uh, the Mediterranean, North Africa there. And uh, Carthaginians are a pretty powerful force. They end up getting wrecked pretty wholeheartedly by the Romans. But this is the, the decline of the Carthaginian Empire. You can see it's heavily symbolized here in the sitting of the sun. Okay? So Turner saw the downfall of empires kind of as a historical inevitability, which is pretty fair. Uh, which was also confirmed by the fall of Napoleon 
1815, just two years prior. And here's its companion piece. This is uh, the rise of the Carthaginian Empire. So it's still supposed to be like in its infancy. We can see that nature is still pretty dominant, but it's going to be getting conquered, essentially, so that man can sit its mark, its civilization. And then we're supposed to be seeing Ditto here. He's from uh, Virgil's uh, The Aeneid. Uh, this is supposed to be the morning of a great civilization. So the sun is rising, you know, it's not sitting. So pretty easily, I, I guess, easily recognizable symbolism. I think most of us are acquainted with ideas such as the sitting sun and, and such. But here's just to give you an idea of what he's looking at. This is a Claude Lorraine seaport with the embarkation of the Queen of Sheba. This is what Claude Lorraine does a lot. He does a lot more like, he also does kind of pastoral landscapes, which are really nice. I, I highly recommend looking at Claude Lorraine stuff. So it's really good. Okay, this is perhaps uh, Turner's, one of his most famous. It's a snowstorm, Hannibal and his army crossing the Alps. So that's the name of the painting, but they, they're they kind of dwarfed here pretty drastically by the storm. Uh, and the storm also, you get that sense that it's coming in, right? Because it's not just taking over literally everything. You do get some sunshine on the left, but then as you move towards the right, it definitely is dominating pretty much everything. So we get the fallen elephants and it's just you know wreaking havoc uh this is the uh he's he's turner's perhaps the most famous today but during his own time he's the second major british landscape artist and he's also in many regards he puts interesting historical subjects in his landscapes the other guy that we're going to look at here soon is mostly just like your typical what you think of when you think of landscape artist uh put simply but he was definitely interested in the sublime, that sense of the powerful, awesome forces in nature. Like you can, and I think you can get that idea here. Uh, but he also is very much interested in atmosphere. He's interested in lights, but he's trying to be more expressive, as you can see here, as I kind of pointed out. Uh, he's looking to the great landscape painters of the past, and he's trying to outdo them, which I think in some regards he does. Not that he's necessarily better than them, still. But he's got this penchant for the spectacular. It's very grandiose. It's kind of turning these landscapes into mythological and historical paintings, kind of just on an epic scale. And again, as I mentioned, uh, Hannibal was a Carthaginian general. He led his troops across the French Alps in 218 BC uh, to launch a surprise attack on the Romans. And Hannibal's actually in the right corner on an elephant or he's supposed to be for the artist, uh, but he's very insignificant to the wild storm. But we again get this dramatic light and dark. It's kind of a reference to Napoleon's 1800 march across the Alps as well to invade Italy. So the theme again is just kind of folly of empire building. Like human activity is insignificant compared to sublime universal forces like nature, of course, and the weather. Uh, but we're less interested in reproducing a specific landscape. Like this isn't necessarily accurate. Like, the mountains, the French Alps don't actually necessarily look explicitly like this. There's no place there that you can find that looks just like this. We're trying to give you a feel and the general idea regardless. So, But he's, he does help to inspire those French Impressionists. I kind of mentioned it earlier. Some of Turner's greatest paintings depict the ancient wars between Rome and Carthage. Uh, he kind of just, again, kind of saw it as a parallel for the conflict between Britain, uh, of course, his own nation, and Napoleon's France. Hannibal is very famous for being a renowned general, but he kind of this attempt kind of dooms him, and so again he is very tiny in this painting, kind of lacks heroism, of the conventional history paintings like we would have seen in the neoclassical era, so just again that empires don't last, but just a great play with the forces of nature to emphasize the frailty of human endeavors really. There's another one, the burning of Parliament. So this happened. Uh, this happened, and Turner actually witnessed it. So uh, he painted it from memory. He actually did several versions of this, and that's it back there on the left. Again, not really in the foreground, but he be he did begin painting uh, oil sketches of the Thames in 1805, and uh, sometimes he would work on a boat. And he would pr uh, paint on a prepare like a roll of prepared canvas. And he would tack them, like in sections over a frame or board, really. But each subject was painted to a size that he regularly used. 
uh, for exhibited pictures, suggesting that these ske sketches really were the beginning of pictures which could be refined later in the studio, which is not an uncommon thing necessarily. Uh, we will get with the impressionists like painting in plain air, just like going outside and just painting the whole thing right in front of the thing you're painting. We don't get that explicitly so much at this time where it's like you go and take sketches of it, maybe even several sketches like Turner, uh, but you usually will go back to your studio and actually finish the product, not be finishing it out there. Okay, and this is actually, this bit right here is about the painting we're going to look at next, which is perhaps Turner's most famous single work. Uh, Hannibal Crossing the Alps is maybe... This one's pretty famous in America, I should say. So I guess maybe it just depends. And it's gotten a lot more attention these days, I think, than perhaps it did in its own time. Uh, but regardless, the hugely influential art critic John Ruskin, who's worth knowing as well, received this painting as a gift from his father in 1843, when the budding writer was only 24 years old. Ruskin devoted a passage to the painting in his 1847 book, Modern Painters, but he eventually sold the work. It is said because of, his, of its disturbing theme, in truth, he probably needed the money, but in 1876, Alice Hooper, who came from a family of abolitionists, uh, when we say abolitionists in this regard, we mean people who wanted to abolish slavery in America, bought the painting and brought it to Boston. In 1876, slavery had already been abolished, but it sounds like, you know, Alice Hooper was already, you know, she was a family of people who were abolitionists. And I guess you would still be abolitionist, even if the thing itself had been abolished. You still support that. Uh, but Hooper advocated exhibiting pictures with an edifying social message, and she immediately lent the painting to the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. By the time Hooper's nephew sold it to the museum in 1899, the painting had achieved international celebrity. And it is still quite famous, and it's still in Boston, actually. I think, in some regards, paintings can and should have an edifying social message, but they don't always need to, and I think that's the problem today, is that they feel like they always have to, and we don't just appreciate good art um, simply because it doesn't say the politically correct polit nonsense message that they're supposed to say now. But this is the painting, The Slave Ship, painted in 1840. So, he was inspired in re uh, to paint this after reading a book by Thomas Clarkson called The History and Abolition of the Slave Trade. Uh, so it's about a story that actually happened. In 1781, there was a slave ship called Zong, the Zong, which is the ship we see in the background there, uh, and it had ordered 133 slaves to be thrown overboard so that insurance payments could be collected. Uh, this event probably inspired Turner to create this landscape and to choose to coincide its exhibition with a meeting of the British Anti-Slavery Society. Um, and at that point, of course, at this point, slavery is not quite outlawed in the uh, United States, but it is outlawed in the British Empire. It's uh, completely outlawed in 1833, actually. And uh, Turner and many other abolitionists believe that slavery should be outlawed around the world. And they, I mean, they mostly get their wish the British help enforce that, essentially, and help end slavery in most of the world, um, especially the Western world. But this was actually first owned by John Ruskin, uh, and he did sell it, uh, as I mentioned, to that American abolitionist. And by the time it was sold in, in America, though, I mean, it was still, there was still slavery in America, so. But if you haven't noticed, because it is still kind of just a big swirl of haze, as you get uh, with lots of Turner paintings, here are the details in the front. So here are the hands dipping underneath the water, and there's shackles. Almost seems like there's blood in the water with how much red he decided to put in here. So you're just seeing... It's like... There's another detail of the leg. It looks like piranhas, like fish are eating the person. It's very dark. But at the same time, it doesn't seem... An, it doesn't seem that way initially. Because we're, we're kind of muting it a little bit by the scale in the grand scheme of things many atrocities happen this is just one of a number particularly inhuman and something that we could stop via our law uh, hence the idea right uh, but it's you know people on the boat don't care and the forces of nature don't really care that's what's helping to end these people's lives more speedily I suppose because uh, they're doomed regardless uh, and they're they're going to return to nature, return to dust. But still sad. So I think I think he gets that 
point across well without it's not on the nose you know but he still does it well and it'll look more like this is just like extra hazy <laughs> uh, so in, in his later years he uh, he used oils just more and more transparently pretty much uh, it's almost all atmosphere light in shimmering color like the objects are barely recognizable to be completely honest so but very influential on the impressionist particularly Claude Monet uh, who carefully studied his techniques so this is supposed to be a train uh, as you can't tell rain steam and speed the Great Western Railway oh, the train other detail on the left side okay but that was it for Turner we're gonna look at this guy just briefly so this is Richard dad the fairy fellers masterstroke uh, this is a uh, this includes a couple of specific characters uh, who are who are, would have been known at the time Oberon and Titania but the rest of them are just from imagination it's kind of weird so this this painting because it's like so obscured by like the leaves of grass it kind of demands closer attention uh, to look at it more closely and in some regards I think that's well that's definitely done on purpose but I think in some regards it fits the subject too. fairies most Americans don't believe in fairies but I know there are other countries that there are still perhaps more rural populace that do let me know if you do I guess but they tend to be hidden and you don't often see them and when you do it's like out of the corner of your eye and like the moment you try to focus they disappear so I feel like this does a pretty good job because they're mostly kind of shrouded by the nature around them and you have to you have to look closely to be able to tell what's going on so here are a couple of details you can see the attention to detail I mean he definitely knew what he was painting and like what he looked at just even including the plants in front of the figures themselves so it's smoking you'll see like this weird puff of, is this supposed to be a puff of smoke I don't know this is so weird um, very interesting very interesting okay we just looked at him for half a moment hope you liked it <laughs> next we we're looking at who would be the most famous landscape painter in England during this time and that is John Constable who also got that opening quote from at the beginning very beginning of this presentation so view on the steward near Dedham I may have mispronounced those <laughs> let me know just to give you an idea he likes doing this like these little rivers through a simple countryside area this is perhaps his most famous work right here this is the Hay Wayne also called landscape at noon Hey Wayne is just a horse-drawn wagon. It's what we see right here crossing the ford. Uh, this is in Constable's native county of Suffolk. And Suffolk would traditionally have been considered too ordinary to be subject matter, essentially, you know, for a painting. But we are getting this new sense of national pride. So we're going to, it's good to paint any part of England because it's still England, right? And, uh, Part of it also, though, is we're trying to get away from the cities. They've become rather oppressive during the Industrial Revolution. They're kind of a, a hell holes um, during this period of time. So this is much more appealing uh, than that in many ways. So don't really blame them either. It's also just kind of a window onto his childhood and his own personal past, right? So it's a kind of an idealized vision of childhood, which is fine, but also, again, very romantic. Uh, we do like landscapes but again it doesn't need to be some epic or more historical idea to be accompanied with a landscape kind of like John Constable did in many regards but just just for the sake of it because why not he did do a like like Turner did a bit later uh, Constable admired called Cla Claude Lorraine he did a lot of his pa uh, paintings uh, sketches outside uh, he considered painting a science and he very much loved to paint nature and so very much under close observation so he would do a lot of his oil sketches but then he would complete again in a studio this one is a six foot by six foot canvas so it's pretty large uh, kind of elevating landscape to a higher status it used to be at these salons like the bigger the canvas the for the more important subject matter so the history paintings and stuff like that would be on really large canvases and we didn't really do that for landscapes too much but we're gonna start doing that more kind of help elevate its status in some regards 
But we definitely get the attention uh, to the intangibles, like light, weather, atmosphere. So again, that scientific interest uh, in like cloud formations as well and weather effects uh, really helps. So, it, but it also gets this interest in like the shifting moods and like transitory character of nature, as in it will never look the same way twice, right? But he's also just really good at painting skies. Like he seems, he was pretty influential. Even someone like uh, Delacroix, who we'll look at when we get to France, uh, was known to have even repainted one of his skies after looking at John, this work by uh, Constable. But we're getting that new sense of vibrance through those things. Uh, to help with that atmosphere and the effects of light and stuff and weather, we get flecks of white paint to just suggest shimmering light. Kind of breaks up that color, though, too. So we're kind of just focusing on the, the wonder of the ordinary in many regards. Humble sittings, not really idealized or classical. This is what we're going to get a lot of when we get to realism later in the 19th century, which is in some regards a reaction to this. I think this is better than realism, if I'm being perfectly honest. <laughs> but... You know, we don't have to heavily idealize things because it doesn't have to be classical uh, and we don't have to make it too grandiose and fantastical and unrealistic like we are with like we do with Blake and Turner, although I think those are fine in some regards. And it can still be beautiful and it can still be romantic too. So but we do get some details. We get the dog over here on the near shore and then uh, the boat. And then we, of course, get the hay wane. And we also get harvesters in the distant field. Uh, we get puffs of smoke coming from the mill. Doesn't really show financial pressure on the constable on the constable property, which was there, uh, as there is a new way of life taking over that is very industrial. So, in some regards, we're already kind of being nostalgic about what we're in the process of losing at the time. But here, you can see all that white paint just flecked throughout some details. Again, here's the view on this down here, Denim. You don't see as much obvious white paint here. I think the atmosphere is still good. It doesn't have that shimmering effect, though. Uh, perhaps it's not noonday or whatever. But still good. John Constable is definitely worth knowing. If you go to any, you know, fine arts museum, you'll probably see a constable landscape. You should go check it out. Okay, another name to definitely know is John Henry Fusley. So he's got a different, he's got a little bit of an interesting surname. He's actually Swiss. Swiss born, but he was, he does pretty much all his professional stuff in England. And uh, again, this one's kind of early romanticism, but he liked to depict the world of dreams, which is a bit different. So he was kind of giving form to fantasy. In fact, Sigmund Freud, who of course is known for his interpretation of dreams, which you should read as well, uh, owned one of his paintings. So, and it, it was a reproduction of this painting hung for years in Freud's consulting room. But here, we show both the dreamer and the dream. So the dreamer, of course, being the lady. Uh, but we're showing that both so kind of help you get that sense of terror, experience terror. I don't personally feel terrified watching this. There are a lot more uh, graphic and horrific stuff, especially if you're acquainted with surrealism, <laughs> which we get a bit later. But perhaps during the time, you can imagine this was not something you would see frequently as, or really at all in paintings. We're supposed to get this idea of sublime terror kind of ignoring what paintings are supposed to be about. So the figure sitting on her chest is an incubus, which is an evil spirit. Uh, you might be more acquainted with the term succubus, uh, which is the female version essentially. So it presses on her chest, kind of cause the panicked breathing that typically accompanies the anxiety of a nightmare. So we kind of get this multiple layers of meaning as you do often in dreams. We get the power of the gaze from the incubus, but also this horse, the crazy horse back here on the left, Although it's kind of tempting to understand the painting's title as like a punning reference to the horse, the word nightmare does not refer to horses. So, uh, rather, the now obsolete definition of the term, a mare is an evil spirit that tortures humans while they sleep. Just so you're aware. We're not talking about a mare as in the horse. <laughs> And then another one. So something you've, we've seen a lot, um, we, I guess, haven't looked at too much, but a co very common depiction in art is classical themes. From the Renaissance onward, you get a lot of classical stuff, like Greek and Roman stuff. And this is mythological, but it's not, one, it's not a classical one. This is uh, Norse mythology, so a bit different. Fusley himself was Swiss. He actually was a minister, but he left Switzerland to become an artist, and he was a... Uh, very much interested in psychology, if you couldn't guess. 
Uh, he was also interested in the idea of the anti-hero, uh, one who kind of follows personal passions to attain freedom and fulfill individual needs rather than just explicitly helping people, innocents. Um, he did study in Rome at some point, but he uh, kind of dis- dis- uh, dismissed Winkelmann's uh, adulation of the calm grandeur and noble simplicity of Greek sculpture and the perfect harmony of high renaissance. He was like, ah, whatever. Uh, so he kind of gravitated towards, if you can guess by the body, the figuring here, Michelangelo. Um, Michelangelo's twisting muscular figures, uh, especially on the back wall of the Sistine Chapel, the Last Judgment depictions, which would be late Michelangelo, it would be late Renaissance work, so a bit more different. Not as serene as the high classical stuff we get from Michelangelo. The late Renaissance Mannerist stuff. So, uh, if you don't know the story, this is from uh, essentially the Germanic equivalent of Homer's Iliad and Odyssey. We get the Norse epic instead of Greek mythology again. Uh, but Thor is, this is actually how Thor dies. He dies from the uh, serpent's poison, the Midgard serpent, uh, Yomengenda. But the, uh, we kind of get the neoclassical planarity. There's not a lot going on in the background. Uh, and you do get this sense of tightness to mostly on the figures to get that Michelangelo feel, but it's still also kind of loose, especially here in the water, uh, directly in front of us. The lighting itself is not really consistent either. So it's a bit different. Those are all things that are obviously we're not copying from the neoclassical stuff, even though this is kind of during the height of the neoclassical tradition. Uh, we get a very dramatic light, and that loose brushwork, despite the figures, we get mostly loose brushwork and a very dramatic composition, right? So we get a lot of extreme angles. This is an odd angle that we would not normally get. Like, it's kind of planar in some regards, and it's austere in the background, but it's like, this is a very weird angle. A lot of uh, odd foreshortening. But we are on level with the serpent, actually, so we're kind of here to feel the stormy water, like the the chill and the fear. So it's, I feel like the overall tone of that is pretty, it's pretty accurate. So, uh, but it's again, of course, part of romanticism. So we get this idea of this horrific theme, just violence, the forces of nature, kind of this turn to a fantasy world when life is too uh, mechanized, really. And we do that today in many regards too. We have our own heroes, even if they're Iron Man or Star Wars and whatnot. Uh, we like to create our own heroes. I think cool, Thor's cooler than those guys, those, but still. <laughs> Again, something that we really like is the sense of the sublime. Uh, something that sublime's not stuff we've really focused on too much up to this point. We look more at beauty or the spiritual content, especially during the Middle Ages. Our theories of aesthetics are going to start to include the sublime more during this period. Uh, including from Edmund Burke, the Irish philosopher, his uh, theories on the sublime and beautiful. He wrote, it's b- very easy, quick to read, highly recommend that. A very, inter- very basic intro to, I guess, very simple ideas of aesthetics. Highly recommend you read it. He wrote it when he was like 19, so I, I choose to ignore that because I was thinking, wow, what was I doing when I was, like, when I was 19? He described the combination of terror and elation as a sublime which is experienced by the individual in relation to the vastness of nature. Uh, a modern artist, perhaps one of the modern artists I, I appreciate the most, uh, Barnett Newman, says that he tries to make his paintings large in some regards to give you the sense of the sublime, but I don't think it's specifically the large painting. Like, the canvas itself doesn't necessarily need to be large. I think it's the understanding that we're putting... We a modern art doesn't do this very well. But with romantic art, it's the window onto nature. You get this vast expanse of the universe and of, of nature again, but you know that it extends beyond the canvas. Like, this is what reality is outside of this gallery. I think they do a better job at it than modernists do. Uh, they do a better job than, than modernists in pretty much every way. So uh, there's that. So there's the, again, sublime. Something that in nature that invokes awe, wonder, and fear is kind of a general understanding of it. This is George Stubbs, again, kind of an early romantic painter. This is a lion attacking a horse in 1770, which is actually something he saw. He witnessed, um, oddly enough. So at the same time, just to give you an idea, neoclassicism is the dominant force during 1770, but it's still at the same time, while the neoclassical style, there was a growing fascination at the time still with the power of nature, with the exotic, 
and with the Sublime. And this actually is from a series of 21 paintings. Uh, this is the only one we're going to look at. I recommend you look at the other ones, though. And he went to Italy, uh, but he said there was really nothing for him to learn from the Greeks and Romans. So how very romantic of him neglecting that. Uh, but he wanted nature, really, to be his only source of inspiration, which I think is fair enough, but also, again, very romantic. This is, But that's also kind of an Enlightenment ideal, which we see a lot in neoclassical stuff. But he even dissected horses to study anatomy. Interestingly enough, you can see the really strict, odd musculature of the horse here. Perhaps that is incredibly accurate. I don't know. I've not spent much time around horses. Uh, but regardless... And uh, he actually did see this happen, like I mentioned. That was in Morocco. Uh, so we're kind of supposed to get the sublime here, like feeling of horror. Especially the horse is white, kind of this symbolize goodness and purity. And we get these ominous storm clouds overhead as well that are just almost in reaction to the event that is happening here. Uh, to the lion committing a sin, essentially. But there's stubs. So you'll find a lot of artists Again, there are a lot more artists. A lot of these artists we're just going to look at very briefly. We're just going to look at like one work. And here's another one. Joseph Wright. The Old Man and Death. So again, this would be early Romanticism, 1773. But he lived near Birmingham, England, which is kind of, I guess in many ways you could call it the center of the Industrial Revolution. He had this romantic curiosity for the miraculous or unusual so we like to put a lot of powerful emotions, which I think you can see it from the old man. The old man looks like he's about to have a heart attack. But this is actually a theme from Aesop's Fables. Aesop's Fables, if you haven't read, are worth a read. It's pretty much just a collection of Greek fables. <laughs> so very simple and digestible for kids is what we often do it here, at least, I don't know, elsewhere. But the man, the story is that the man was exhausted from carrying his wood, which you see there uh, he's still grasping onto partially or perhaps picking back up. And... Uh, he was exhausted from carrying the wood and asked, like, you know, just talking to himself, to ask death to take him away. Then death appears and terrifies the guy, and he's like, he now insists that he's he's fine, you know, he's fine, he'll, he'll resume his work, <laughs> which is a bit funny. But uh, we do get these ruins in the background. These are supposed to be gothic ruins, uh, which is, again, that romantic, kind of that melancholy for the effects of time, the ruins of empire and stuff like that. Uh, but we do get a lot of high detail. Uh, kind of making the unreal real here. It's a bit odd. But just the fact that we have a walking skeleton as death going towards this man, like the intense emotion, it's definitely not nearly as austere as you see for neoclassical stuff. And it's like, this almost, you could remove these guys and this could be a, 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 bit, a bit of an odd angle, I guess, for, for most landscape paintings, but it could almost be a landscape painting with just the ruins here in the foreground uh, rather than being a little bit further off. But quite nice. I like it. Okay, another artist we'll look at just here for a moment, just to give you a different idea. Uh, this is not necessarily a landscape painting, although I guess you could say we're turning into one here on the left here. Uh, but this is Thomas Woodward, the rat catcher and his dogs. This one's a, a bit later than the last couple we looked at in 1824. So he's the village rat catcher, which apparently used to be a job. I don't know, maybe some villages out there still have this job. <laughs> but he is identified by, of course, the cage with the rats in it, but also for this... Uh, unusual hat band the band he has across his hat that has uh, rats on it that's supposed to be so it's portraying his prey and telling you his his job his occupation uh we do get the cat back here stalking the rats in the cage which is a different little you know a little detail uh and woodward himself just to give you an idea of some what some other painters were doing he's got a pipe tucked into his hat here but he's got he was employed actually as an animal painter oddly enough so and he was actually employed by queen victoria but he also did paint landscapes as you can see here again on the left that he he knows how to paint the landscape and also historical subjects so lots of times you'll find the artist paints largely what they can get paid to do <laughs> so if in this guy's case he got paid to paint animals which go figure right okay this guy is not super famous but i wanted to talk about him because he's perhaps he might be my favorite uh, romantic art artist from England, but this is John Martin. Very English name. Uh, this is Moonlight Chepstow Castle. We're going to look at a few of them all relatively briefly. But he was uh, he was pretty popular in his day. He was criticized pretty heavily by a lot of his critics. Uh, but I think he's good. I think he's really good. He celebrates 
the fantastical and like the grandiose kind of like uh turner is not as like fluffy and hazy as a uh as a general feel this one perhaps more so than the next few i'm going to show you but the uh he captures that fantastical and grandiose stuff uh, makes the human scale a bit smaller so that's kind of tense with romanticism but i think he still he still has a very high appeal and lots of times you'll find that oh the art that has the most appeal it's the most kitsch it's the most uh you know niche it was not even really niche in many regards but like the most popular art is low art like art that appeals to a lot of people tends to abandon quality for its appeal and then think of popular media today it can be very obvious but the uh not always so the best kind of art is that stuff that the problem is like you can have like great great detail and great taste but then you're going to exclude so many people from appreciating it and that's okay in some regards. There are It's okay to have your own fandoms or whatever. But there's something to be said about when you can find that appeal to a lot of people, but it's without abandoning quality. And I think John Martin does it better than even Turner does, in my opinion. So the medium here, and this perhaps why it looks so odd, is actually watercolor with uh, gum Arabic. But... And this is actually at an art gallery in uh, South Australia in Adelaide. So congratulations, you guys. I guess you guys can have something. But this, what we're looking at, is actually the oldest post-Roman uh, fort in Britain. And it's actually in Monmouthshire in Wales. Chepstow Castle. And it's still there if you want to go look at it. <laughs> if you live nearby, I guess. Yeah, very hazy, very romantic looking at ruins. We like to do that. Uh, we get we do get the figure over here gazing at it, and we get this one guy who seems to be the shepherd with his dog going towards his cattle over here on the right. And it looks like we have a new church on the bottom right, but of course it's still in the shadow of, of ruins. And so it's very, very interesting, like a, the economy. The main attention, though, is definitely the ruins, though. So I quite like it. This is the destruction of Pompeii and Herculaneum. So Pompeii and Herculaneum, if you remember from the neoclassical lecture, if you watched it, where the excavation of that, discovery of that, rediscovery of it, was a huge uh, kickstart, essentially, for lots of neoclassical fascination. And uh, here we're showing it destroyed. We're not really celebrating the classical stuff here. Perhaps it's like the idea that we like the Enlightenment in many ways, right? As we like many of their ideas, even if they didn't necessarily work out because of the French Revolution and stuff like that. We like the ideas, but it was destroyed by cr crappy people. <laughs> uh, destroyed much like the things that those thinkers also were fascinated with. Those thinkers were fascinated with things like Pompeii and Herculaneum. Those things were destroyed, and now their hopes and dreams are being destroyed as well. So uh, it's interesting. And of course, Pompeii and Herculaneum wasn't destroyed by bad guys it was just destroyed by nature and again we like that fascination with nature and i think you definitely get it here with this it's like very very odd it's like a weird framing of the bright um the bright background here in the middle where the ruins are and the people are fleeing here like it's a big line of them the people again kind of like mallard paintings are very much dwarfed almost seem rather insignificant so it's again it's a look at a scale to quote a uh, reference barnett newman again uh this something i think he actually gets right and not that sublime comment of his is that it's not really the size that counts it's scale that counts everything in relation to something in the best relation you can you know think of when scale is to man to us you know uh we're the ones that matter in that regard and that's what makes it meaningful and so the people are small they're dwarfed by uh, the nature, uh, by the horrible event that's about to take place. The horrible event only really matters to us because people died, right? And it's displacing people, too. So I think he captures that pretty well. And it looks pretty fantastic. It's pretty epic. Get an idea of his epic scale. And again, also some religious paintings, because he actually does paint a good amount of religious stuff is a uh, because we do still get again christian themes uh 
and he does actually paint some that are f like focusing on the scale the grandiose scale of god's creations through exaggerated nature i didn't have i didn't put any in here uh, but there's also stuff like this uh, where you can see that grand scale but also the destruction which we just seem to really like during the romantic era and it's on an unfathomable scale like i don't like this seems almost fathomable compared to this this looks like the earth is just completely rending like folding on itself as you get if you couldn't tell these are people here on the bottom that are just absolutely getting sucked away by this so and on the on the left and on the right i think the left perhaps especially since you can see the lighting the shimmer of light here to separate this chunk of the rock that has completely separated from this mountain like the mountains are just toppling over i can't imagine i live next to mountains and i feel like yeah <laughs> you, you could have, just take me away i guess at that point but okay another one manfred and the alpine witch so manfred is actually from a closet drama by lord byron a closet drama if you don't know is just a play that's supposed to be performed by simply being not really performed but it's just i guess if you want to call it it's performance it's supposed to be read by like one guy on stage sometimes you'll have multiple people to do different characters and whatnot but you're not really up there acting it out you're just reading that's pretty much all it is so it's like a longer play a longer poem just meant to be read on stage though and this was a pretty popular one, actually, by Romantic painters. Even the American great Thomas Cole, who we'll look at when we get to Romantic art and pa uh, painting, also did some from uh, Manfred. Uh, and uh, John Martin did several for Manfred as well. This is just Manfred and the Alpine Witch. But that very uh, fantastical sense. Like, this is, this is awesome. This looks so good. <laughs> like, this is why I'm picky about fantasy book covers, if you're acquainted with me. It's because they lack in comparison to work to work such as these. They're so tacky and kitsch. It's just like ugh. Not that all of them are that necessarily, but then you get stuff like this. Like, I mean, look at the look at the Lord of the Rings covers. Like, there's been so many different variations, but they put good stuff like this on there. I don't want no tacky crap on there. It needs to look great. And of course, maybe we don't always have John Martin to come paint it for us. But this looks so good, and it's a more uh, fantasy story in that regards too. But yeah, looks so fantastical, so hazy and like uh, intertwined. Like it's just, I don't know, it's so weird. The effect over here on the left that the sunlight has on this mountain makes it feel like it's made out of putty. But even just like the whole texture that it just winds itself through all the rest of everything else, it just in the, in the clouds and the mountains that just continue on forever, pretty much in the background. It's just, it looks so good. It's so fantastic. It's so awesome. And just the last little idea for John Martin, he not only painted a series for the Manfred, but also for Paradise Lost, which is also a story you should be acquainted with, hopefully. But And this is Pandemonium, which, of course, etymology being Greek's pan for, like, always, all, every, and then daemon, or demon or evil spirit. So the place for every sp evil spirit, pretty much, Pandemonium. And this is just... This is claustrophobic almost like this is just too much like it's pretty much hell and this is just on such a grand scale it makes me sick almost but just to think because of the negative subject matter mostly but so interesting again so fantastic and cool and epic and even these figures that are like it's it's like the opposite of what he does in many regards like where you get such an awesome landscape. You don't really get the landscape. You get this uh, cityscape almost. Just one huge structure. Uh, with all these hypostyle halls. Like just constant pillars up there. Uh, and you get the figures actually closer. They're bigger than normal. But they're still so small. And so insignificant compared to what is housed in this building. You know. So a bit odd. Very talented. Really like them. Hope you guys like them too. As I said, these slides were have been tweaked by me, and this is definitely someone I have added in. A tiny look at architecture. We're only going to look at a couple things here real quick. Uh, we do get romantic architecture as well, right? So we looked at a little bit of neoclassical architecture. But romantic architecture mostly just means revivals. It's revival styles. We're going to look at Egyptian, Greek, Roman, Romanesque, Gothic, Renaissance, Baroque, Chinese, Turkish. We're going to look at a lot of stuff. So uh, even several periods might be implemented to a single building and whatnot. Uh, Gothic revival is a big one. That's what this was is from. 
we like gothic architecture gothic architecture is you know justifiably so like gothic architecture is amazing probably the best single period we have for just architecture uh regardless but the uh he's trying to evoke like the awe and gloom of gothic romance novels that's kind of the idea with the gothic revival in many ways not just how cool the architecture is but we really like the gothic romance stuff too and so this is font hill abbey it's no longer there so this is just an engraving of it uh it was a house <laughs> actually some guy made it and uh to look like this like this grand abbey but it was actually just a personal home but it's also just the scale is supposed to give you that sense of the sublime. This looks awesome. They should try to do it again and actually make it successfully. Because uh, it looks like a gothic cathedral in size and in scale. It actually it didn't last very long because the tower kept collapsing. Eventually it collapsed and crushed the west wing. And they pretty much just they just tore it, most of it down. There might still be a tiny bit left. But I'm pretty confident they tore the vast majority of it down. If not, eventually all of it. But there's that. That's in Wiltshire in England. We also get this House of Parliament. Very cool, very iconic. Not just it's burning down for William Turner. This is probably the most famous, actually, I think of. Just most famous Gothic revival building. So it was commissioned in 1836, and that's when it was begun after the former one b burned that we saw for Turner. Uh, it was kind of meant to bring a sense of national pride uh, of England's past, hence the Gothic style still it's kind of less sublime though kind of just more picturesque you get this kind of stable balance to it this sense of symmetry they hired uh this welby pugin guy to do the gothic details like the spiky towers gothic arches and tracery um the towers themselves are kind of more like fortress like though kind of like battlements and we just added gothic detail to it so definitely gothic revival bit odd kind of nice though still okay and then this one's a different it give you a different idea of the variety you might get so eclecticism is a good term to know but combining several styles and periods and that's what we definitely get here this is the royal pavilion in brighton on the southern coast of england uh so this is also a good example of orientalism so we looked at oriental we didn't look at it really in this lecture we looked at it at the very end just to give you an idea in spain where they were uh painting uh odalisque but Orientalism is seen in architecture as well. We like looking at the East. That's what Orient means. Uh, so we get these cast iron domes. But we also get minarets. We're quoting some Gothic stuff with some details. But we're also getting Chinese, Islamic, and even Indian architecture. And that includes both the interior and exterior. I actually don't have any, a picture for the interior. Uh, but again, this would be a very great example of eclecticism. Um, we're combining lots of different styles <laughs> and periods. So very interesting. I think it looks pretty good, though. I don't think it looks as good as this, and I don't think this looks as good as this, though, if I have to be honest. But rest in peace, Fontail Abbey. But, yeah, that's all I have for you guys this time. Please let me know what was your favorite, who perhaps your favorite artist was. If I am going to give you guys my opinion, if it wasn't obvious, John Martin is my favorite of all the ones that I showed you, but if there's not a single one I dislike, it's kind of hard and when someone has so much talent, it's kind of hard to dislike their work, right? Regardless, uh, please let me know. Uh, if you have any questions, also feel free to ask. I'll do my best to answer and should be continuing again next week with another lecture with romanticism again. I'm trying to remember where we go next. I think it's Germany. Yeah, pretty sure it's Germany, <laughs> regardless. Uh, but please feel free to like and subscribe and comment. I greatly appreciate it. And I will see you guys next time. Have a great one.